Hey, everybody. You all ready? Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're doing here is we are reflecting on Ad House Books. Uh, Chris Pitzer is publisher of Ad House Books. There are uh, four of us here who were published by him, and we're going to do our best to make him cry. Um, we just want to tell nice, nice stories, reflect, let him say what he wants about his time in the business. I'm the moderator. I'll introduce myself and then these other people. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do me and then the other end because Chris sat next to me. I'm going to let him be last because he's important. My name is Andrew Neal. Um, I used to own Chapel Hill Comics in North Carolina, and I sold the store in 2014. I met Chris when I was a retailer. Uh, now I self-publish an ongoing comedy so far for comic book series called Meeting Comics, and Ad House published a collection of the first six issues. Down at the other end, we got Sophie Goldstein. She's an award-winning graphic novelist, illustrator, and comics instructor living in Tulsa, where she's a Tulsa Artist Fellow. Her comics include House of Women, An Embarrassment of Witches, and the Ad House published The Oven, which was shortlisted for the Cartoonist Studio Prize, won an Ignatz, and was one of Publishers Weekly's Best Books of 2015. Next to Sophie is Max. I will not mention I've known Max since he was 12. That might embarrass him. Um, Max has no last name, too. Max Huffman is mostly. I was getting to that. Stop. Come on. Read the whole paragraph before you edit me. Max Huffman is uh, mostly a cartoonist and illustrator in Carborough, North Carolina. The rest of the time, he's the print graphic designer for the Cat's Cradle and the assistant director at Peel, Peel Gallery. He has self-published a wide range of hilarious comics, including Hyper Mutt, Funky Dianetics, and Big Drink. Ad House published a collection of some of his comics called Cover Not Final, which lost an Ignatz Award this year. Congratulations. <laughs> Got Kurt Ankeny next to Max. Kurt is an award-winning cartoonist and painter whose work has been featured in Best American Comics at the Society of Illustrators and in Comics Workbook. His comics include In Pieces, which is, was excerpted in Best American Comics 2017, Saltwater Snow, which won the MoCo Award of Excellence, and the Ad House published Pleading with Stars, which collects many of his shorter comics. Next to Kurt, Chris Pitzer, the publisher of Ad House Books. He has deep roots in comics, having worked at Eclipse in the early 90s. He's also an accomplished graphic designer, which you can see when you look at the books he's published. He designed those. He's closing up shop at Ad House, having published 101 publications from comics to graphic novels to art books, and has been nominated for and won far more awards than I can list, including Eisner's, Ignatz's, the LA Times Book Prize, the Doug Wright Award, and my favorite award on his list, the Best Bookmark. <laughs> um, I'm going to start things off, just uh, tell a little story about my history with Chris Pitcher and Ad House, just to get us going. And then I'll step back and guide the way if I need to. Otherwise, I'll just let people talk. I met Chris when I was a comic retailer. Uh, I think we were both on a comic professionals forum, and I contacted him about Project Superior. Um, I enjoyed a bigger percentage of the work he published than any other publisher out there and was able to sell it well, too. I did great with Project Superior, with Mesmo Delivery, with those James Jean books. Uh, and more important than all this to me is that I got to know him. Um, I'm, I'm doing it to me. <laughs> try, try. Try. I, myself, try. I got to observe him over the years. Uh, I got to observe Chris over the years at uh, comic conventions and at signings at my store. And the best, I, what was it? The best signing of all time? I think I, I, when I closed the greatest my, signing when of I all closed time. my store, we yeah. had the greatest signing of all time, yep. which he attended with with uh, Jim Rugg and others. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is Jim the only Ad House published one at that? No, Tom Scioli. Oh, published Tom, American that's right. Barbarian, Tom was but there. I never published Ed Pisker. Never published Ed. Yeah. Um, and I observed that Chris was always kind. He listened to people who talked to him. Always happy to contribute to a conversation and to teach, without teaching them, if you know what I mean. Uh, he's one of a couple people I have known in comics who I have been impressed enough with their behavior toward other people that I have tried to emulate in my own way uh, because, you know, I just have always appreciated the way he deals with other people. Uh, I think it speaks to his kindness and his easygoing attitude that I consider him more a friend 
than a teacher, having said all that. So I also appreciate that he published me. Uh, that means a lot too. Now, is there anyone else who, who wants to go next, or should I pick somebody? I'll, I'll go next. Go ahead, Kurt. Okay, so can you all hear me without me having to lean over to the mic? Um, so one of the things that I wanted to say about Chris, and I think that is something that, I don't know if it gets overlooked, but it doesn't get mentioned enough, I guess, is that Chris had a huge influence about the way that comics, especially indie comics, look today. Like the stuff that was out before Ad House started up was very much still in the vein of uh, underground comics of the 60s and anything that was sort of like um, bits of... Uh, Kurt, I'm sorry. Hey, guys in the booth, everyone can hear you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Right. Thanks, Sophie. Please continue. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I shouldn't have laughed as hard as I did. <laughs> um, but anyway, so like if, uh, you know, like especially for the younger folks in the audience or even, you know, it's hard to keep track of like indie comics because it's so, so diverse and it's just so spread out all over time and over, over the, the space of the country and whatnot. But, uh, you know, it definitely came to my attention when, when Ad House books started publishing Nobody's books look like these books. These books like just were so next level compared to every whatever what it was out there, and just like the details for the printing and the the quality of the stock, the presentation of the comics, it really was like comics putting on its tuxedo at last. Um, and uh, and I, I just feel like that that doesn't ever get it doesn't get mentioned enough in my opinion, and I, I really feel like that's the biggest part of, of Chris's legacy, in, in, in addition to being an all-around nice guy and publishing some of the you know, biggest names in comics, um, that he really changed, like all those arty comics and all those comics, everybody that's like you know, paying attention to their, what shape their corners are and what card stock they're on and what Pantone colors there are, that's mainly due to Chris. Um, well, so. th thank you, but I mean, there were people before me. I, I mean, know there were, yeah, like but... D Dean Motter was a wonderful designer. Um, you know, Fran and Graphics had a few good people there, yeah. but um, no, I appreciate your kind words. But I, the other part of that, too, is everybody's caught up. I feel like you look at Piao now, yep. um, these other, like, uh, I think it's, what, Glacier Bay? Uh, I don't know them. Yeah, um, really beautiful-looking books. And I think it's just everyone's elevated design within the comic realm. Right. But, well, uh, because when Ad House Books started putting this, everybody else was like, well, we gotta, we have to catch up. I think you're just like, saying, I'm old, right? Yeah. So I, I was that's so that's old saying, that I was one of the really first nice people to... Yeah. Way of Thank saying you. You're old. Are you Thank going you, to you vet know. all of our compliments? Yeah. <laughs> I'm old. Yeah, yeah. He's going to deflect everything. <laughs> Max or Sophie? I'll jump in. Um, so I think I mean, my, my personal story probably, I think, represents a lot of other um, young artists um, and Chris, but um, when I was first going to conventions and I had my mini comics and I would like go up to publishers and be like, please take this um, with my compliments, sir. And, uh, and Chris was encouraging and was like, and um, remembered my work from the year before, and uh, at, a, at a certain point, when enough of these awkward ex givings had happened, um, you said, you know, if you ever have something you're interested in getting publishing, published, you should reach out to me. Um, and you said it very casually, but of course, to me, this was like my world exploding um, with possibility. And, uh, you know, and so The Oven was my first published book, and uh, it was a really great experience working with Chris. Like he accepted the like the story was already complete and he accepted it um, fully. He had one uh, the one feedback on content was like I had this very graphic birth scene. He was like, libraries might not carry it if you show it. So I just slightly changed the angle because I do want my book to be in libraries. It's not bad. It's a good thing. I, I visited my local library and that's my one takeaway. She had. Jason Little's book that had come out that had a birth scene, and they were not in the library. They were in her office. And she's like, I know it's weird, but we can't show birth. So that's why I wanted yeah. your book in libraries as well. Yeah, no, it was like a, it was good feedback, but in terms of design, 
there was a lot more back and forth. And I learned a lot from that experience of uh, doing my little cover designs and getting feedback from Chris and like putting together this like very slick looking little book here. We have, um, I have a blog post about it that shows Sophie's like 30 some uh, thumbnails. Mm -hmm. And it's just, if you ever wanna, it's a, it's a nice design post and I, you know, check it out. Because she did, she proposed like 30 different cover designs and we went through them and I think we ended up with a good solution. Yeah, I think that all of the limitations that we had, because you, because at first I was like, maybe we can do full color, and you're like, well, one color, and ultimately it really made the book. Though I think that it like was a a choice, a limiting choice that actually turned it into like a visually much better book, um, and so it was great. And I think that that's probably reflects the experience of a lot of like new artists who Chris has published. So. And so to her point, I, I brought a, a, sh a learning moment with me. <laughs> um, so black plus a color. If you don't know about her wonderful book, it's about a world where there's two suns. And so constantly you have sun rays hitting you. So the second color is orange. Mm -hmm. And to get the most out of only using two colors, Sophie started using screens. And when you use screens in printing, one of the concerns is you might end up with a moiré. So the way to check that is you go to the printer that's doing the job and you have them do a wet proof. And what a wet proof is, is when they take the files and they print on the actual paper. And so this is the real paper, these are the real files, and I got this and I was like, wow. <laughs> now seriously, I was like, this looks great. And what I ended up doing was, I think I printed a thousand more than I had planned because the book looked that good. But that's what a wet proof is. And if you're doing screens and stuff like that, you should definitely have the printer make you a wet proof. It's a little bit of money, but it's worth it in the end because you don't end up with a book that's messed up. Did you want this, Sophie? I just pulled it out of the Ad House archive like a month ago. Yeah. And I'll also say regarding Sophie's work and mini comics and Chris, I first found your work, Sophie, because I was at an SPX and Chris showed me The Good Wife and said, you should go get this. This is the best thing at the show this year. And I went and I talked to you and I bought all the comics you had and it was because of his recommendation, his recognition of what you were doing. You make good comics. I mean, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> this is backfiring entirely. You're like, we're gonna make Chris cry and he's making oh, all of I us cry. I see the strategy now. <laughs> he's just too good at his job. He's just a tear man. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I first met Chris at Zine Machine in Durham, North Carolina in uh, 2017 or 2018, 2017 maybe? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's Too a, long ago. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, it was, it's, a, it's a very small show. It's, it's, re, it's very regional. It's a great show. But by some stroke of luck, I was placed with my, with my punk friend next to the ad house table. Yeah. Um, and, and Chris was so stoked by the idea of, of new young cartoonists. And that's something you truly rarely see. <laughs> uh, and he bought everything on our table, despite the fact that most of it was very bad. And um, he, I, I, I just, it felt like a, a door had been opened. There was an, a, a friendly face. And I think I pestered you a couple times in the following years with just like, here's this new thing. And you'd be like, okay, cool. <laughs> that's, that's cool. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, and then during the pandemic, I, I started putting together old comics and I redrew a bunch of old comics and work that had um, existed in the same kind of fictional universe over like some that went all the way back to college and I um, just sent this PDF to, to Chris with a placeholder cover that just said cover not final in big brush strokes. And I said, uh, hi, Chris, here's this. Um, I don't know what you'd want to do. I have it in my head um, as, as this like Archie collection and like my dream, and I know this is crazy, but my dream would be to have it like an Archie digest on the, on the newsprint and um, it's it's full color, and I know that's and, and it was just like, okay, 
<laughs> All right, we can do it. But uh, one condition, uh, can we, we have to keep the title Cover Not Final. Uh, <laughs> the, the name of the book needs to be Cover Not Final. Or, uh, and it was a, it was a joke, I, I believe, but it was, the correct, it was the correct joke, and it was the correct <laughs> title, and I was so glad because it was just going to be something uh, like Crime Digest <laughs> or something, you know? <laughs> Um, and everything else, it was like, uh, can it be full color? Okay. Can it be on newsprint? Okay. Can it be on like the Archie Digest newsprint? Yeah, I'll go find some. And I was just so geeked. This book is like exactly how I wanted it to be. And um, it just, I, I'm, I couldn't be happier and grateful. And I've got the Archie Digest at the table. Really? So after the show, come by. I want to give it to you. I mean, I, I just have it there. It's not like I'm doing anything with it anymore. So it's <laughs> yours. But I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Zine Machine show because I'm almost certain that was like the only time I was like the baller dude where I'll come and give me one of everything. <laughs> and, and like, and it's like I just want I wanted to like be that guy to someone like you and see what happened. And so I think like you were there for like half an hour, like thinking, how much do I charge this guy? You were like adding it up, and then you're like. $40 sound okay? I was like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> but yeah, no, industry, I don't know how much people know, but if you have a book coming out and it's out there for solicitation, more than likely if the cover's not done, it's called Cover Not Final, so everyone knows not to look for this image when the book comes out. And I Google it, nobody ever done a book called Cover Not Final, so I was like, let's break that wall. Be the first. Good job. Trendsetters. Trendsetter. <laughs> It's also just like a, such a, a, a kind of, not a gamble, but it's to give a never published author a perfect bound full color book with like some nice production touches is just such a commitment and such like a, a statement. And I'm just really appreciative. Again, you make good comics. And with Cover Not Final, honestly, when I read it, I laughed out loud like three times. And I was like, that's the litmus test. You know, it's like, if I'm laughing, I think other people will laugh. So why shouldn't it be published? If not by me, somebody would. But I like the opportunity to do it. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if someone else would publish it. <laughs> especially, especially now. Yeah, you're right. Maybe. And you didn't put a belly band on it. I did not. Well, but you, you know what the effed up thing about it is, though? What's that? I tried to get tricky with his ISBN and put it like in that weird ass shadow shape yeah. on the back cover. Yeah. It's not scannable. It does not work. That's but I never huge. heard stores complain. But I like tried to scan it and I couldn't get it to work. But at that point, I was like, eh, who it's cares? done. Who Whatever. Cares? <laughs> Let it roll. I used to. I used to give. Uh, I used to give Chris trouble as a retailer about belly bands on an ongoing basis. Belly bands are the little. Uh, flimsy like a, piece like of paper. Flimsy piece of paper, like a partial dust jacket that wraps around, and when you slide it in and out of a shelf, it gets destroyed. Yeah. Uh, and they're they can be very beautiful, and retailers hate them. I don't mind them now that I'm not one, but I had to. <laughs> I had to at the time. He's completely right, though. He at his shop had a copy of Driven by Lemons, which had a belly band. And God bless you, it was taken off, but that belly band was destroyed. Yeah. And like, as a customer, I doubt I would pay full price for an inferior product like that. Right. So you're completely right. Right, right. And it was a, it was a question of attraction versus function in that case, yep. I would say. Yep. Uh, I mean, I also tried to get a hold of people at Vertical with the right. uh, Buddha books. Like, yeah. stop doing this. Yeah. Stop printing them matte white so they're destroyed. But they didn't listen to me. You sort of did. Yeah. I stopped. You pretended. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I find interesting about the way Chris operates is that, like, uh, I think, like, Sophie and Max's stories, that I found you, like, really, really easy to work with as far as, like, design back and forth. And you have such wide-ranging, eclectic taste. Like, did, I'm curious, like, did you ever have one of those books that was just a beast to put together, or did you, you, know, you and the artists were just at loggerheads or whatever? And I, I see, feel like you're so easy going with that. No, I mean, it, the book that took me the longest to publish or produce is the Paul Pope book. Right. Be, I mean, that's because it's Paul Pope. Right. But I feel if he <laughs> hadn't come to SPX and we sat down 
in whatever you know restaurant was up there yeah. at the time with I'd made a map and we said okay this section goes here this section goes here. if we hadn't done that I don't know if the book would have ever happened mm -hmm. but that's like the hardest one for me to get out the door I mean design wise there wasn't a lot of back and forth it was more the editing of the content I need this content in a certain order and it, you know yeah. just to get it done yeah, yeah, yeah. Because how long was that? How long was that process? I want to say it was like two and a half years. And, you know, yeah. I mean, that means it was probably late by two years. Right. But, um, yeah, and I mean, with, with your book, I mean, mostly your design. But I think this is my, I love the color field suggestion. Yeah, no, that was of great. Just like these beautiful, like, just pages that are just color to, like, break things up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was all Chris's. So, like, the out the exterior was Chris was like you know give me your cover design and I've you know I've done my own books before I've published my own books before mainly <laughs> because of some of the knowledge that I got from like Project Telstar when Chris published it he would have like a little information in the back that said like oh this was printed on this press with these Pantone colors on this paper <laughs> and uh, did you print it too small for yourself no it, it's <laughs> very thin type but it's we did the same type. thing here yeah, yeah well because I was like I was like you know that was so important for me as a young as a young person and like as somebody who's interested in graphic design it was a little bit of a peek behind the scenes that no, nobody else was doing and like I was so interested in these books um, and it sort of demystified a little bit of the process and I said so when we came to doing this and Chris had this great idea of you know flooding the the opposite page from the title title page of each individual story with a nice bold color which was just right um, and I was like well we should do that with my book because uh, I love that and he's like I have no recollection of doing that <laughs> <laughs> 300 GSM da dong is the cover stock <laughs> yeah but my favorite thing about the credits page is the little heart yeah yeah that there. was a really yeah. nice little touch the takeaway is if you're a cartoonist and you think you're thinking a lot about design, you're not thinking enough about it. <laughs> it yeah, you, well, and to, to that point, honestly, if you are publishing something, get some other eyes on it because you, you, you're too close to it. You need a new set of eyes to like possibly see things that you aren't seeing. So, yeah. I'll, I'll say, having worked with Paul Pope once as an art director on something, you're lucky to have have gotten the book out at all. I'm serious. I mean, that I, if, guy. That, if that SPX hadn't happened, I don't think the book would have happened. I got, it took me half a year to get one cover out of him. Yeah. It was good. It was exciting. He's, he was, a, he's he a rock was, star, man. He was almost done the whole time. It was very exciting. <laughs> Final tweaks. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he was coloring it for three months. When we got it, it was black and white. The, um, <laughs> it was super cool. Uh, I'll say about uh, the design work on mine, my book, happened really quickly because uh, after Chris and I decided we were doing a collection of my comics, uh, he asked me if there was a particular show I would like to have it out for. And I said, how about Noyce in Norfolk? And he said, well, that's in about three minutes. Uh, get it to me, get me the cover like in three days and, and we can have it ready for that because it was, it was a really short turnaround. Um, and I said, okay. And I, I knocked out a cover. I spent the entire time kind of going back and forth with him on it. And um, I appreciated the fact that he, that he made that happen. Uh, he could easily have said, there's not enough time. You know, you need to put the effort in to get this better and we, we'll get it out for some other show in the future. But he knew that I really liked that show and that I wanted to have the book out for that. And, uh, and it turned out to be, you know, essential to get the book out like 30 minutes before COVID hit. So that was, <laughs> it showed up February 2020, which meant I got one show with it uh, until this year. The door shut. It was the door <laughs> shut right there. So maybe that's why I got it, because we rushed it. I don't know. But, uh, but I really did appreciate the, the fact that he was willing to work with me to try to get the book out in time for the show I wanted it out for. I thought that was that was more than most publishers would have done. And if you're not familiar with Noise, that's like a small or uh, a small SPX show in Norfolk, Virginia, put on by um, Greg at Local Heroes. And I love the show. I think it's great. Um, 
Yeah. February? It's in February. Yeah. So it's cold. And it's, there's no other shows then. So you can get down there, find a bunch of cool stuff. It's in a brewery, you, so yep. people's judgment is impaired, so they buy a lot of your comics there, yeah. Yeah. which is why I wanted to set up. Yeah, yeah you know? You it's, wouldn't think there'd be a beer goggles effect on comics, but well, there is. Yeah, absolutely yeah. there is. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good show. They get them home, and they realize they're not all in 3D. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe one of the greatest and perhaps final gifts that Chris has given us is that he, he published right up to the, the, the end of Ad House, which gives like five different cartoonists the, uh, the selling point of being the nail in the coffin. Yeah. <laughs> right. Who, who killed the company? <laughs> oh, tell the, tell the Catherine Inman story about Grass of Parnassus, about how she... Hey, who's the moderator? Tell Sorry. Catherine <laughs> about Grass of Parnassus. Are you, you talking about when I called him? Well, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So essentially, you know, we, I, was, I don't know why I thought about it, but I counted up how many books Ad House had done. And I was like, we're getting close to 100. So we had sort of said that we would publish Grass of Parnassus, which was originally published on Instagram. And so I said, are we inked? Are we good on this? And they said, yeah. I said, so it's the 100th book. And by that, I mean, you know, numbers can be fudged this way or that. You can read however many ISBNs we have. But it's close enough to 100 that it's 100. And so you're the 100th book. And then I was like, there's one other book. It'll be 101. And I was like, you know what? I'm kind of done. So then I, like, had to call them. I was like, listen, can we do a phone call? And they're like, sure. And so we set up a phone call. And I was like, listen, we... Um, I know we agreed to do Grass of Parnassus. We are doing it, but I am done with Ad House. I want to shut it down. And Catherine got like the sweetest, giggliest, like, <laughs> yes, we're the book that killed Ad House. <laughs> and I was like, if you want to think that, I'm totally fine with you thinking that. But they are such sweet people that they, I guess, cherish the idea that I knew when to say enough was enough, and they were happy about that. Yeah. Well, and Stuart did such a good job of giving you, like, fan service on the design of that book. It's covered with pluses. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> now, it, it, it's a good one to go out on. Um, it's, a, it's, like, the most eminent book, I yeah. feel, out there, because, yeah. like, if you like to read a book from A to Z and have that story spoon-fed to you, it's not that book. This book is confusing as hell. <laughs> but it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's art. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, it's such a like it's such a left turn from most of most science fiction that's out yep. there in the world, you know. Yeah. And most people probably know them from Stuart superhero stuff, yeah. which is really um, Marvel and DC accomplished or, and straightforward. Yeah. Uh, but this is absolutely not that. <laughs> yep. But yeah, if you ever uh, check it out, um, there are little Ad House logos all over and spot gloss on it, so. <laughs> it's nice, nice little art, art object. That's it, I think, right? Is that it? <laughs> we don't. Want to cut it early? No, we can. Um, if does anybody else have anything particularly they want to bring up? I'll take questions if there are any, and if not, we'll talk some more. Yeah. Do y'all want to say anything else, or we go straight to questions? It's up to you all. Questions. Questions. Yeah, questions. Anybody want to ask a question? Yeah. What advice would you give a small publisher seeking wider distribution? Uh, I mean, honestly, if we're talking direct market, the only distribution is Diamond. So if you're not doing Diamond, you should be talking to Diamond. They're not going to give you the best numbers because you are a small press. But uh, other than that, then you start teaming up with distributors who distribute work like yourself. So like Domino. Um, who else? Radiator. Radiator, thank you. Yeah, Radiator's great. Um, we did a, a comic called Viewatron, and Radiator is debuting the second issue here at the show. And Neil was kind enough to reach out to me to get the paper type. Mm -hmm. And so essentially to keep the library for Sam and Peach the same um, for their book. And it made it happen. It came out. It, yeah, it's right there. Craig has a copy. Nice. I, I mean... It's bigger than... Uh, -uh. Uh -huh. Somebody messed up. 
That's some Pope hat <laughs> shit. That's some Pope hat stuff, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, other anybody else, other distributors you Bird think Cage of? Birdcage Bottom. Yeah, Birdcage is great. So I would get you know copies there, and because then your your work is getting out to like-minded people, I assume. Yeah. Maybe Silver Sprocket. Yeah, oh, they're they're fantastic too. They're a store in San Francisco. Yeah. Anyone? I have a Hooray. question. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Sophie. No, audience first, please. No, no. Me? Oh, okay. Um, so what, what, Chris, what for you was like the first impulse to become a publisher? Where did that desire come from? It, it came back to what Kurt was saying a little bit, where um, I love book design. And I don't know if you know this, but I was doing book design before Ad House, but I was doing it for free. Mm -hmm. And so at that point where I was made aware of Pulp Platoon Pilgrimage, I actually sent that out to like three publishers. I sent it to Fantagraphic, Star Horse, and Top Shelf, saying, because I knew them from SPX. And I was like, listen, this is a good book. You might like to publish this. And of course, nobody got back to me. So no, with that, I went back to Joel and said, listen, should I start a publishing company? Because why shouldn't I get paid for my book design, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not thinking that, oh yeah, I'm spending a lot more money. Than I, you know. <laughs> but no, I love book design. So, I mean, that was the impulse to start that. And having worked at Eclipse Comics, I had a little bit of knowledge there, made contacts where if I did have a question, I could either ask Jeff Mason from Alternative or Ted Adams at IDW. Mm -hmm. So it was all those things. Not knowing any better. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss when yes. you get into comics. Yeah. No, and to that point, I mean, I still have copies of Pulp Platoon because I printed way too many. <laughs> 20 years later, I still have copies. So if you're thinking about publishing, just whatever you think you should publish, maybe do only 75%. And then cut it some more. And then cut it some more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a, my, my first book, which was a collection, my first self-published book was a collection of this webcomic that I did. Um, and uh, and we were like, okay, we'll print a thousand. We did a Kickstarter. And then it was like, and then I was like, well, it's only like a couple grand more to print 2,000. It would be <laughs> foolish not to. <laughs> uh, fast forward. How, how many pages is this book? It's oh, a big book. Yeah, it's like 360 pages. Hardcover. <laughs> hardcover. It's hardcover. Yeah. There's they're 12 to a box. One yeah. box oh. is 12 books. I still have like a storage unit in Pittsburgh that I've not seen the inside of for four years that has just a stack of these books. And I don't know whether I hope that they're all filled with mold or hope that they're still fine. <laughs> right? Just to be free of the burden of these books. But anyway, you should all learn, don't do that. <laughs> mold would be a tax right yeah, really. Then just burn it down. <laughs> Open the door, throw some water in, yes. shut it. Yeah, a little HBO Max action. Yeah, yeah nice. Uh, Craig. Yeah, I was going to piggyback on the last question by some people just here too. I, my sense also is, and, and certainly Andrew would be one example of this, that individual retailers are contacting you at house books too. Um, is that a, a good venue for distributing your books as well? Or? It definitely is. Um, you build up your clientele of who you can um, work with and trust and do business with. Um, but it's like if you step back and look at the number of them, you kind of get depressed because it's pretty sad. Um, and just like me quitting Ad House, there's you know, retailers that either go on to the next life or just you know, decide to not do it anymore. But it's, it's an option, but it's not a feel-good option. Not that Diamond's a feel-good option. That's not a feel-good option. But um, yeah, no, we've got, and actually I have an um, email list, you know, one to the general populace, and then one to retailers. And seriously, I think that list is 33 stores. And I feel yeah. like that's not even real. It's probably less than that. Well, to that point, too, about I was ordering books direct from Chris, but it was, it was absolutely specific books. I didn't order the entire line direct. If it was something that I just wanted to order a couple copies of and give a shot, I would order it from Diamond. I mean, that meant I was more aware of him than most retailers. Uh, but for big books, books that I expected to do well with and I wanted a case or two, I would order from him. Or any time I said, oh, this is huge, let me, let me try to get 50 or 100 copies before he sells through the print run. That hopefully will last me a couple years. Then I would contact him for that. 
But uh, even though even though I think I probably counted as an ad house store, it was uh, it wasn't every every single publication. Uh, and I think every publisher probably has that situation where there are things that hit really hard and there are things that hit less hard. Uh, and uh, that's just <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. the way it works. And it's like any sale is a good sale, right? But um, And you want the store to get their copies. Right. But if he also orders through Diamond, that's a cool thing because that's one more sale Diamond's getting to make them think, oh, yeah, we're a publisher that they should still pay a little attention to. So it's like... End result, you need copies. I'm fine either way. Right. The, but well, by the same token, too, if I just needed a couple copies, Diamond is the preferred way, but Diamond also doesn't restock things without a certain amount of back orders. Mm -hmm. And you don't always want to throw a back order at Diamond as a retailer because it might sit there for half a year before any other retailer is willing to do that. So it, it's always kind of a, a guessing game and a balance situation. Um, the, the All the talk about Chris's design work and the intricacies of it will, um, I'll talk a little bit about my comics, not these, but the ones I self-publish. Um, many of the early ones, I did things like, uh, and they're, they're zines, they're mini comics. I get, I get the pieces from a copy shop and I trim them and put them together myself. I would say they're slicker than most mini comics, but uh, I would frequently early on do something like print four pages in color to feed in with the black and white pages and show markups and corrections, sticky notes that I had drawn corrections on. And I was inspired by two things. One was some of the Chip Kid design books out there, like for Batman Animated, which would show storyboards with sticky notes over them, which I thought was the coolest thing to see. Uh, there's a Peanuts book that he also designed. It has shots of original art, but also shots of old decaying newsprint clips and I thought it was just really cool to see that. And so, also, Jeff Spear is the photographer. And yeah. He never gets credit. Okay. He should get as much credit as Chip Kidd. Yeah, I the think. photographs are beautiful. Yeah. It's yeah. it's photographs of art in a book, and it's gorgeous. And then the and I thought maybe I can do that. And then my other thought was basically like, look at all this cool stuff that Pitzer will slide into a book. Sometimes it's completely unnecessary. Uh, but, but that was definitely part of my reason for wanting to do something like that, just to make a mini comic a little bit extra. Because, uh, you know, I knew somebody who did that with other books on an ongoing basis. It was, it was a, uh, there wasn't anything he did that was exactly what I did. But it was, it was something that I thought of when I was thinking, do I really want to take the time to hand collate one color page into these before I staple them together? And yes. Yes, I do. I yeah. want it. I want that visual effect. It's it's worth it because it's going to be cool, uh, and that turned out to be early on one of the things that m people mentioned to me about my stuff. They're like, "It's really cool how you do this. Why do you do that?" <laughs> uh, and you know, then I would say, it, "Here here's why." And they were like, "Oh, I thought it was because it's set in an office and there's sticky notes." Uh, <laughs> but and I think my like reasoning with all that too is that. You know, what was it, 10 years ago where comics became digital? Yes. And so Comixology was out there. And we worked with them for a bit, but not that long. And when we axed our relationship with them, I decided, okay, I dig online comics, but I really don't read them, read online comics. So everything I make, you know, print-wise, I want to be an art object. Yes. So it just becomes a little bit more special. It's appreciated a little bit more. And... I don't know. It's just, it, it's out there. No, I think so. I think there are things that uh, beyond the uh, the story or beyond the joke, beyond the piece itself, that you can do with a physical piece that are much harder to do if you just send a PDF or have it in a web page or uh, in some other digital format. And take that, Scott McCloud. Yeah, <laughs> that infinite, infinite canvas. Yeah. Well, he predicted webtoon, right? Um, yeah. But that, that's, that's that. Anybody else got a question? Yes. What's next for you? Um, uh, I got, I got to read a bunch of comics that I own that I haven't read yet. Um, <laughs> see some shows. See, some, yeah, and then you know, I don't know. It's like I have a huge collection personally. And so I, I think, you know, maybe at my age of 55, it's time I need to let some of that go. 
So I've thought about setting up at the, the regular shows, and maybe even SPX if they had me back. Like if I came to SPX, I'd want to sell just mini comics. <laughs> All the mini comics I've purchased over my lifetime. So I mean, it's like I've been thinking about that. I'll still help other publishers if they need design or you know ideas or anything else like that. There's like a couple books I'd like to see happen. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it's like you never know if they're going to happen or not. So, that type of stuff. Walk, walk the dog. Take it easy. Just come to SBX and set up an advice booth like Lucy. <laughs> Just say, like, come on. <laughs> yeah. The doctor is in. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Is, uh, is it designed the best book compiling? I'm old school, and I'd have to say yes. But I mean, I was a Quark Express guy for ages. <laughs> and But it's like, once I was forced into InDesign, there's some pretty cool features in there. One of which is, let's say you lay the book out, like your 24 page book, you know, eight and a half by five and a half, you know, one to 24. You can go down to print and say, print pagination or something like that. And it takes every page and flips and flops them so it prints out the way you know it should so when you fold it, it, it reads in order. Right. So it's like back in the day, I would make a dummy one through, you know, one through 24 and figure out where every page goes and then have to lay it out. And you have two different layouts. And with InDesign, you only have to have one layout and it does it. So I mean, if, everybody, if anyone has any other suggestions, I'm all ears because I am old. So, <laughs> I'm not on the cutting edge. Any other? InDesign CS6 is the last one before they um, went to the cloud and just say uh, it's out there. I, I hate <laughs> subscription model. I mean, it's just, it's so much wasted money on our part and so greedy on their part. I totally love that you brought that up. Thank you. Yeah, I have a Photoshop that. I don't even know what number it is. It's prehistoric. Yeah. Is there anybody even competing with them in software? Like, I mean, yeah. as far what's that? Yeah, but I mean, as far I feel as like, like they're I feel like about to go assembly, subscription they're too. They're getting better. Uh, actually, if you have it on a computer, it is you own the software, which is um, great. Um, um, they're not a subscription, but they're getting better. Like every time they do it, they're making more options to actually do layout and stuff. So they're improving their software every time they give us a new release and. It's been pretty good. You can actually do a full comic and then have it all ready for print now. They did oh, okay. announce that for uh, Clip Studio 2, they're doing a subscription model. Uh, uh -huh. Yes, but they might not because everyone was mad at them on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Since like, when does a company pay attention to that? Yeah. I feel like that company does pay attention. Celsius, yes, I think yeah. they do. Because a lot of the changes to this version of Clip Studio came out of suggestions. They still don't have CMYK mode, though. Yeah, that's a point. <laughs> I have a question for Chris, and maybe it's something you don't want to consider. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens to the artist, Chris? What happens to the artist of the type of which Ad House published? What avenues do you see for them going forward? Where do we go? In, in, in today's <laughs> What do we do? <laughs> what, are we, what are we gonna do without you? What do you mean, where do you go? <laughs> I'm You're at Fanagraphics. Josh is at Fanagraphics. It's not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> Those guys are old too. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Let, me, uh, let me present the question in earnest. What avenues do you see going forward for uh, artists like of the type you publish? Where, or in other words, where are Fanographics and Top Shelf going to get their people now that you're not digging in the sewers <laughs> paying for gold? I appreciate Kurt saying that. I wrote the first draft of my pitch for this panel uh, included the recognition that uh, that many of the artists Pitzer has published have been ruthlessly snatched away by other publishers. They, he's He's the first publication for so many important, uh, known artists, cartoonists, who have gone on to, 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 to do work that's highly considered. And he has so frequently been 
the first the first publisher, the one who who's like, oh, this is good, and it's like a flag goes up, and everybody else is like, oh, I want them now. I, I am the stepping stone. Yes, in other words. exactly. Yeah. You're the Bush League. But um, Hartley Lynn <laughs> will go to D and Q. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who else do we want to know about? I think the Eminents are done. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, uh, but honestly, yeah, no, I mean, I don't feel like the selection is great. Koyama's gone, Piao's going. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people I don't know because, again, I'm old. Um, I like Glacier Bay, but I feel like they have their own thing going on from what I saw upstairs. Um, I think more people will self-publish early yeah. works that you would have published yeah. because it's, it's getting easier digitally. Yeah at the least, to put it together. I don't know if, if some kind of dystopian thing will cause the cost to roll back up in a way that it's not feasible anymore, but in the meantime, it's not. It's a lot easier than it ever has been to self-publish something that if you have design abilities, looks like is, is a professional grade book, uh, even, even with some print-on-demand services. So I think probably a lot of people who Pitzer would have published will will self-publish if they get out there, but that takes a different type of mindset than yeah. just somebody who wants to make the thing. Yeah. Well, it's also like, and it's also skipping over that early validation that like yeah. those young cartoonists will get sure. by being actually published by somebody else. You know, it's one thing to publish yourself, and it's quite another feeling to be published by. You somebody. just gotta love yourself, Kurt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. I think I think there's probably a many, many very talented cartoonists out there who will never become largely known because they don't have the appetite for yes. self-promotion and self-publishing and things like that. And so having um, publishers who are willing to take that chance on a first-time author is always going to be really essential. Um, and hopefully other people will step into the void. I think that's enormous. Yes, that's a great point. And I mean, even I, who had all all decency driven out of me by 20 years in retail who would, who would <laughs> say anything to sell my book felt so good to be published by him you know it's it is very validating yeah. anyone else got a question yeah can you tell me what happened to book two of Duncan the Wonder Dog <laughs> excellent question <laughs> no <laughs> How many did he say he was going to do? Nine volumes. They Nine weren't all going to be 400 pages. <laughs> you know, I've sent him emails, and I've gotten no reply. So um, He's probably working on he's, it. Well, yeah, that's it. He's working on volume two. <laughs> he's, he's coloring them. As <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, my answer is not it, right? It's like somebody else can publish it, and that's great. But um, thank you all for coming. This is wonderful. I love you all. Comics, SPX, yay! Thanks, everybody.